Welcome everyone to the session. Just before we start, I want to check if you can hear me okay and if you can see the slides. I can see the slides, so I'm hoping everyone else can as well. Also, if you haven't already and you'd like to, you can turn on captions by clicking turn on CC captions. But just beware, this doesn't always pick up perfectly what's being said. And also, just to let you know, the session's being recorded, but please don't let that put you off contributing in the chat pane. Only the slides will be visible on the recording. Um, there is a register in the chat pane, and we'd be grateful if you could um, just complete that. It's just a short forum. So, we'll get started now. So, welcome to everyone. I'm now going to begin the webinar. My name is Mary Brodie from the Improving Gender Balance and Equalities team in Education Scotland and I'm joined today by my Tayside STEM colleague Hazel Gardner. Hazel's going to be doing a lot of the, the tech stuff for me. Um, next slide please Hazel. To start off I'll just go over some protocols and expectations of the session. I'm just going to read through the slide here. Um, so please turn off your microphone when you're not speaking and this will prevent any background noise interference and please also turn off your video while we're all together. We're not actually going to be going into smaller groups I think today. If you've got any questions you can either write speak in the chat pane and we'll pick up on your question or you can just type the question directly into the chat pane at any point and we can swing back to it. You can also use the chat pane to post a resource link or to make a comment for others in the meeting to see. And as Hazel said earlier on, if you lose connection, don't panic, just come back in following the link that you received. If at any point, like it, the, the slides aren't moving on for you or if you lose sound or anything, if you come out of Teams and go back in, that usually does solve the problem. Um, also just a final reminder that the session has been recorded, but please still contribute. And next slide, please. Thank you. So today, what we're planning to do, we're going to do an introduction to gender stereotypes and unconscious bias. So talk about what these things are and why it's important to tackle them. We're going to be looking at how gender stereotypes and unconscious bias start, the impact this has on children and young people, and also a bit of thought around what are your own experiences, what can we do to mitigate things that do happen around these, giving you some practical strategies to take away with you and we'll be finishing at half past five. Next slide please. So before we get into it, a bit about the Improving Gender Balance and Equalities team and our remit. There are six IGBE officers within Education Scotland, each attached to a region and I'm attached to Tayside. The aims of the Improving Gender Balance and Equalities programme are to encourage settings from 3 to 18 years to challenge gender stereotypes, to become aware of and address our own unconscious bias, and we'll be exploring further what these things mean, and to promote whole establishment approaches. Research has shown this is the most effective way to bring about lasting change, and our overarching aim is set a wee bit apart there, is to improve gender balance and subject uptake and learner pathways. So the work we do mainly consists of engaging with schools in early learning and childcare settings to try and address the gender imbalance in curricular preferences, subject choices and learner pathways. It's about trying to get young people to feel empowered throughout their educational journey from as young as three, to have the confidence to make choices based on their genuine preferences, rather than being, by being influenced by external factors such as societal pressures. We want to work with schools and partners to continue to promote equality of opportunity and address unconscious bias with regards to gender. There are inherent barriers to all young people accessing the same opportunities. And while young people, young people, they shouldn't feel coerced into making any particular decisions, adopting the attitude that young people are able to choose whatever they want for themselves won't counteract the problem. It's about promoting equality of opportunity and ensuring that we're providing activities and encouraging learners to engage in thinking and learning that they might not have previously considered or thought was for them. So we look to work with school staff and partners to help them embed approaches to challenge gender stereotyping and addressing unconscious bias with regards to gender to promote a whole establishment approach to equality. So the next thing 
Um, Hazel, could you put up the next slide, please? So, if you've got a smartphone and data, I'm going to ask you to go to um, www.menti and then the it's now in the chat pane, the link. And if you enter the code there, 61561240. So the task I'm about to ask you to do involves you creating word clouds. So it would be really good if you're able to get on. If you're not able to get on, it's not the end of the world. And can we have the next slide, please? So once you get into Menti, it's going to ask you to do two things. The first is to write down words you might associate with girls, and the second is going to ask you to write down words associated with boys. Whatever you put is anonymous, and if you've not been able to go on to Menti, you could just type these words in the chat pane. So I'm going to now try and share Menti with you. If you let us know if you've got any problems accessing that as well. I can that see that now. Yep. Ah, right. Okay. No. I'll just give a few more minutes. So luckily we've got one we did earlier. So um, these word clouds, and I think from what I saw of the girls one is quite similar, I think. Um, these word clouds came from what trainee science teachers said about pupils. But it's worth noting that we do this all the time, like this is something we do within our training. And similar words come up time and time again. So if you just have a wee minute to have a wee look at the the words in both of these, and you can probably see by looking at the clouds what one was for the females and what one was for the males. Um, generally, the word cloud for the boys has words that focus on physicality, strength, activeness, boldness. The word cloud for the girls has words that focus on nice behaviours, passive behaviours, appearance and nurturing behaviours. It's important to know what the stereotypes are so that we can become aware of them and we can begin to work towards dismantling them. We should be living in a society where every young person has the potential to hold a characteristic and for it not to have connotations about gender, because that can be limiting for everyone. And just as an aside, the activity that we tried to complete on Mente, that can be adapted to do with groups. And you can just do it in, um, on paper by asking learners to draw like a wee stick person and write words round about that, the outside of the person. And then you can have a discussion um, about the words that have been used. And of course, we, we all know the words that are used, they are very much stereotypes, but it doesn't stop us knowing the words in the first place and it also doesn't stop them having an effect. In general, the effect happens unconsciously. Unconscious bias can develop through exposure to stereotypes, and these stereotypes are per pervasive and they're ingrained in our culture. We see a lot of differences between boys and girls here in these words, but research paints a different picture. So, firstly, I want to be clear what I mean when I'm talking about gender. This is the gender unicorn, and this visual can be really useful to highlight the difference between gender, sex, and sexual orientation. And um, it's just been posted in the chat pane there. So when I'm talking about gender, I'm referring to the top two aspects of the gender unicorn. Um, that's identity and expression. For the purposes of this training, I'm very much referring to girls and boys, but I recognise gender exists on a spectrum with girls and women in a box at one end and boys or men in a box at the opposite end of that spectrum. And stereotypes help reinforce those limiting boxes, making it harder for girls to express typically masculine behaviours 
and even harder for boys to express typically feminine behaviours. And it also makes it difficult for those who identify as non-binary to feel they fit anywhere. By deconstructing those limiting boxes, we free up everyone to be who they are and choose what they want to do without limitation or fear of reprisal. And next slide, please. So to come back to what the research says around gender, if you could click again, Hazel, please. This quote's from John Hattie. And looking at the first sentence, Hattie's saying, while there are some biological differences between boys and girls, there are few differences cognitively or psychologically between them. And if you click again, please. In the second sentence, Hattie's saying that in terms of interest, ability, attainment, behaviour and many other things, there's a bigger difference among groups of children of the same gender than between genders. And these genders shouldn't impact their future choices. And next slide, please. And it's not just Hattie. This OECD report backs up his findings. So the OECD found that there were gender differences in attainment internationally in 15-year-olds. But fundamentally, no innate reason for these differences. They linked strongly to difference in confidence. So it could be argued that the differences are more about how gender stereotyping has impacted learners' thoughts around what they can and can't do, rather than an innate ability based on gender. The stereotype, for example, that girls are worse at maths impacts girls' confidence and they're less likely to believe they're good at maths. And then this goes on and actually impacts their performance in the subject. So how have we, as a group of people in society, ended up seeing so many differences between girls and boys or men and women when apparently there's no scientific reason for us to be that different? And hopefully this session will start to shed some light on this. So this is the definition of a gender stereotype a widely held belief or generalisation about the behaviours, characteristics and roles performed by women and men, so that attributes assigned to individuals based on gender. So now that I've provided a bit of an introduction, I'm going to ask you to think about why challenging gender stereotypes is important. And when you've had time to think, I'd like you to post any ideas into the chat pane. So I'll just give a couple of minutes for you to hopefully put some ideas in there. see a couple of people typing which is great so that children have the opportunity and access to the kinds of jobs and activities they want to do and not just that's absolutely Colin that's great yep yes Ellen they prevent self-expression and can bring feelings of shame to young people who don't fit in the box so that every individual is able to reach their full potential and not be held back really good and treating individuals fairly without making assumptions about their motivations feeling aspirations that's excellent thank you so much for that folks um so if we could go on to the next slide please and keep putting in your ideas if you, yep equality of opportunity so important helen yeah um and i think there's five things that will come up when you click um hazel so thanks for very much for what you've done already. If you come up with other ideas, feel free to pop them in the chat pane there. And um, what you've said so far, I think, captures really well what I'm about to say. So here are some other reasons. Gender stereotyping and unconscious bias lead to inherent barriers for our young people. Too many young people continue to make choices which conform to gender stereotypes, which in turn limit their longer term career opportunities. And the problem is not just about participation in STEM subjects and post-school destinations, but it's broader and it affects boys as well as girls, as you can see in terms of ELC staff being only 4% male. 
Something that's particularly striking is that research shows 38% of dads lie to their boss to spend time with their children and that the perception from girls is that their appearance matters more than their intellect. Shockingly, in a girl guiding report that came out recently, 50% of 7 to 10 year old girls said women are judged more on what they look like than what they can do and this number rises as girls get older as well and um, that report's been put in the chat pane there. We also know that gender stereotyping and unconscious bias can have profound effects on mental health too, which is increasingly important to consider in the current situation. There's an expectation that men need to be emotionally strong, and this impacts negatively when it comes to sharing their feelings or expressing unhappiness, and this leads to the worrying figures we see around suicide. Lastly, and not mentioned here is um, gender stereotyping is explicitly linked to violence against women. Sadly, something we've seen rise really quite hugely during lockdown. So there are there are a wide range of reasons in terms of education and society why challenging stereotypes is important. And it's also important to consider any effects in stereotyping will be amplified when children and young people experience barriers related to other characteristics and or poverty. So whilst what we discuss in my team focuses only on the impacts of gender, the principles of unconscious bias and stereotyping can be applied to other intersecting characteristics such as poverty, race, age, disability, etc. Next slide please. So we're going to explore the stereotyping that's present throughout a person's life. And here's an example from very early on, the cards given to parents when a child's born. So what do you notice about the differences between the cards? So if you can have a wee look and if you see anything, again, could you pop any ideas into the chat pane, please? Pink and blue, yeah, there's um, pastel colours for the girls and bold colours for the boys, yep. Yeah. The nurturing, yeah, that's really obvious, isn't it? Uh, yeah, the fun dads, the girls being nurtured for as the boys being adventurous. A focus on nurture, yeah. Yeah, the girls being held and the boys being thrown in the air. Um, yeah, that's really good, Laura. The boy looks free and lively and fun, whereas the girl is clingy, needing support. That's excellent. Yep. Um, yeah, that's that's really good. Um, I think you've picked up on them all, so the pastels against bold colours. Um, I don't understand, in the girl one, the flowers are in bloom, and the boy one is dead leaves. I don't really understand that one. Um, there's a butterfly on the girl's one and a bird in the boy's one. Even the shape, a bubble, smooth bubble shape in the girl's one and a more jagged shape in the boy's one. And a lot of you have picked up the um, hug versus the rough and tumble. Um, there's a flower in the corner of the girls one and a star in the boys one. And also in the girls one the branches are delicate, whereas in the boys one it's like strong sturdy branches. So like now we've identified what the differences are, we need to consider what stereotypes are being reinforced by the cards and what harm could it do. The images on both the cards are from a story called Guess How Much I Love You. And it's actually a dad rabbit trying to express how much he loves his child. The stereotypes reinforced for girls is that girls are more passive, delicate and need to be nurtured. And the stereotype reinforced for boys is that they're bolder, stronger and can be played with more actively. The difference in these cards shows the difference in society's thoughts on how a parent should be interacting with a girl and with a boy. The girl needs to be nurtured and hugged and the boy needs to be swung about and played with. We'd probably all agree though that boys need just as much nurture and hugging as girls and girls need just as much swinging, swinging about and play. Both types of activity help in a child's development in different ways and we shouldn't be neglecting one in favour of the other. So what harm might it do? 
it might provide imagined limits before the child's even born and might lead to adults and other children reinforcing stereotypes by being quite directive with how they interact with different gendered children. The way we interact with children at an early age influences their development and if gender stereotypes are reinforced at that young age we might be hindering their potential. And this carries on throughout life. Clothing, the slogans, daddy's little princess, superhero, books, an in-depth analysis of the 100 most popular children's picture books of 2017 reveals male characters are twice as likely to take leading roles in children's picture books and are given far more speaking parts than females. Males were more typically embodied as powerful, wide and potentially dangerous beasts such as dragons, bears and tigers, while females tended to take the form of smaller and more vulnerable creatures like birds, cats and insects. Female characters were completely missing from a fifth of the books ranked. Also toys. In um, the documentary No More Boys and Girls, it highlights really well how we might unconsciously direct children of certain genders to certain toys. In general, boys towards toys that develop spatial awareness, and research has shown this good spatial awareness can help raise attainment in STEM and girls towards toys that are cuddly or where they play a nurturing role. So from a very early age, you can see how different skill sets might be developing as children are pushed towards certain toys or self-select out of activities that might develop a wide range of skills. Um, there's been a, a clip there put in the chat pane and it's really interesting. I would really recommend you give that a watch and you can see the whole of the No More Boys and Girls documentary on YouTube. And there's other examples like film, TVs, uh, programmes where like, mums are the caregivers doing the cooking and there's a lack of role models who challenge stereotypes. Okay, Hazel. So, as I've said, there's no scientific reason to treat boys and girls differently, yet society does because some people believe the gender stereotypes or at least partially believe them enough for it to have an impact. So I've spoken about gender stereotypes and why we need to be actively combating them and I'm now going to go on and talk about unconscious bias, how unconscious bias can affect gender stereotypes and vice versa. So I'm going to tell you a story. So close your eyes or keep them open if you want and picture the scene. And afterwards, I'm going to ask you to do a wee quiz about the story. So try and remember as much detail as possible. A builder leaning out of a van shouts, nice legs, to a nurse passing by. The same nurse arrives at work and casually mentions this to a senior doctor. The doctor said, I'd never say that. The doctor has two grown-up children who are 28 and 30. They get on very well. One is a sergeant in the army, the other's training to be a beauty therapist. The doctor divorced last year and is currently dating someone else. Open your eyes. And next slide, please. So can, I want you just to have a wee look at these questions and have a wee think and in a minute we'll go through them to see what, what your answers would be. I'll just give you a minute. If anyone wants to put any comments in the chat pane, do feel free. I just see a couple of your typing, so I'll just see what you're saying before I move on. At no point did I mention gender. Yeah, we don't actually know the gender or sex of anyone in the story. Excellent. So, so I, hopefully lots of you are thinking don't know, because we actually don't know the answer to any of these questions. And of course, the fact that we're here means we're a primed audience. But what's interesting when completing this, 
everyone will have images pop into their heads when hearing the story. But when you stop to think about it and answer the quiz, what you were doing was mitigating for your unconscious bias. And this technique can then start to be applied to everything you do. For me, when I was hearing the story the first time, the builder was a white male in a white van. The nurse was female. The senior doctor was male. So was the sergeant in the army. The beauty therapist was female. Everyone was white and everyone was um, heterosexual and able-bodied. But we don't know any of that. And I'm sure in each of your heads there was a very clear picture that played out in your mind. Um, our unconscious bias fills in the gaps of what we don't know so that the information can make sense. Quite often the picture will resemble the stereotypes as our unconscious bias might utilise our experiences, things we've seen in the media and assumptions to help build that picture. And there's nothing innately wrong with unconscious bias. It helps us every day. It helps sports players make quick decisions, helps reactions when driving. But the danger comes when we let our unconscious bias make the sole decisions about people and situations. We need to ensure that we're aware of unconscious bias so that we can use logic as well when making decisions. And next slide, please. Our unconscious mind is useful at finding patterns, filling in gaps, making sense of the world. It's a natural instinct how we categorise people and it's based heavily on assumptions we make. We develop it due to the, inf the influence of the world around us and it's created by heavy social influence. It's unintentional, unintentional and habitual and it's really important to remember everyone has it. So we can't get rid of it. Um, but whilst we can't get rid of it, there are ways we can try and mitigate, mitigate against it. And the first of these is by trying to be aware of when you might do something or think something that's influenced by unconscious bias. So not if somebody says engineer, automatically assuming that's going to be a male. And some thoughts will enter our heads automatically as a result of years of social conditioning from the media, from our own experiences. But it's important that we recognise that and we pause to stop and think and examine why. And this applies to our practice as well, because this bias can have implications for children and young people. So a combination of our unconscious bias and gender stereotyping might mean certain choices feel off limits to young people. And this arises from a complex interaction of self-identity, confidence and skills developed all of which, as educators, we can influence positively. And Hazel's now going to share some of the impacts this can have on young people's choices. Thanks, Mary. Yeah, so what we're going to look at here just now, um, we have some pictures, some more word clouds. What we would like you to do is think about these, um, these word clouds came from the Improving Gender Balance um, project, Pupils were asked to write down jobs that they associate with women and with men. Um, so what we'd like to ask you to do, just take a wee second in the chat box again, um, could you have a wee look and post in the chat pane any of the differences that jump out at you in terms of these two word clouds? <laughs> yep, Laura boys have more options straight away, more variety in the boys, yep. Yep, and that's another couple of people picking up on the sort of higher paying jobs, uh, senior positions within jobs as well. STEM choices, Helen, yep, in the boys' side. Boys more manual work. Just give it another wee second in case any of these get any other bits that they want to add. And senior management positions as well. Um, the girls' section is more centred on appearance and, and lower paid jobs. Um, yeah, definitely. And the other point there from Miss Hamill about the focus on nurturing jobs in the girls' cloud, I think in terms of the notes, I think we've managed to get get through everything. Um, 
I think um, the, the one other one that, that we really kind of picked up on as well is um, what jobs do we value most in society? So when we look at these lists, we're, we're looking at um, some of the, the jobs that are being associated with women as being sort of not optional, but it's it, it is it's very appearance based. Whereas you've got um, the firefighter, engineer, doctor, where science society wouldn't function w without them appearing in the boys ones. But but we got pretty much everything on the list. Um, all of these jobs that are included in the, um, the slide here, there's nothing wrong with any of them. Um, but but the concerning thing is is these responses um, were given by girls themselves. Um, so, so girls are um, actually placing these limitation limitations on themselves. Um, but at the age of 12, pupils should really feel empowered to think that they could do any of these jobs. Um, and just to let you see um, the reverse, um, this is the response that came from um, a group of boys in S1 when they were asked the same question. Um, and it's quite concerning how much of a similarity there is between what boys said were for girls and for boys and, and the, the same for um, the girls' responses. Um, it's really interesting where these young people are likely to go in terms of their career based on the actual labour demands and, and the needs of the economy. Um, so when we're thinking about boys and girls... Mm -hmm. um, so, Mary, can you hear me okay? Yeah, you, you froze very, just for a very short time, but no, you're fine. Perfect, thank you. No, I just got a wee message saying my connection had dropped out, but as long as that's back up and running, that's okay. Um, yeah, so what we're thinking about here is if one group of learners is preparing themselves for um, jobs that are in demand in society and for the economy, we're not providing our young people with equal opportunities. Um, and at what point are we allowing some of our girls in particular to cut off certain pathways. If we're thinking about 12 year old girls not thinking that STEM is for them, when you get to 16, 17, 18 and you're thinking about um, subject choices, thinking about um, post 16 destinations, if these um, factors have influenced those learners at an earlier stage, they might then not have, have studied the subjects that they need to progress in those areas. Um, so we really want to think about how we can remove these limitations um, and think about self-identity. Um, Ellen, um, yes, spaceman instead of astronaut. Yeah, I, I just picked up on that point there. That's a really good point as well. Um, so just thinking about that and being aware of these thoughts and expressions that 12-year-olds that are, are sharing as, as part of the Improving Gender Balance project is something that we really want to keep at the forefront of our mind as educators. Um, just taking this one step further, um, what we also have here is some data from the, the SQA. Um, so we're seeing here um, the limitations on subject choice. Um, so this graph shows the percentage of entries to higher STEM subjects that are male over the last 30 years. So the line that you can see starting here right at the very top is design and manufacturers. So that's showing that in 1986, which albeit is a while ago, we're looking at 95% of entries being male. Um, whereas when we look down here, this orange line is for human biology. So actually it's, it's less than half of the entrants are male. Um, where we see these ones in the middle, we don't see as much disparity um, between entries um, for maths and for chemistry. When it comes to maths, that might be down to the fact that the majority of students are encouraged to take maths in the, in the senior phase. So that's maybe not quite as, there's not, maybe not quite as much personal choice involved in the other subject areas. Um, the really striking thing about this graph, though, is we're looking at these subject choices from 1986 up to 2019, and there is very, very little change, despite a huge amount of awareness raising and significant interventions to try and address um, the gender imbalance in these subjects. Um, although what we're looking at here um, is a focus on what we've kind of called the STEM hires, it's not exclusive to STEM. We can also see this um, picture 
um, sort of reversed when it comes to um, what might be deemed as creative subjects or, or care based subjects when we're thinking about arts and languages or, or more recently um, learners studying um, child care courses. Um, what we also have is we can see this replicated not just in, in school qualifications but moving on to apprenticeships as well. Um, so we can see the different apprenticeship pathways um, on this chart, the blue is female and the red is male. Um, and we can see there's a difference in occupational grouping, but there's also an imbalance in the pathways that learners are directed to. Um, so we, we tend to see that a lot more um, male students are actually directed towards an apprenticeship than um, female students. Um, I think the next one as well gives you a wee bit more information. Just bear with me. Um, looking at the graduate apprenticeships as well and again we're seeing a higher proportion of male students studying some of these apprenticeship pathways. Um, but does this mean that by choosing certain subjects girls are shutting themselves off to future employment prospects in thriving highly paid jobs and industries um, and thus further compounding the gender pay gap? Um, what I'm going to share with you just now is um, because we were running this session, I know that there's some people from other local authorities, um, but our, our sort of target audience for this session was, was Tayside. I wanted to give you a wee bit more information within Tayside of, of the local context. Um, so you might have heard of this already. I am very quickly um, just going to put a wee link in the chat for anybody that's not seen it before. Um, the information on this slide comes from the Tay Cities deal. Um, and the Tay Cities deal was signed in December 2020 um, and it's a £700 million project involving Scottish and UK governments um, funding projects across Tayside and Fife. So it's a massive, massive big investment in the area. Um, the strategy aims to deliver a smarter, fairer economy over the next 20 years and as a result there will be an increasing number of opportunities for local children and young people people um, to pursue future careers in many of these industries, although the Tay Cities deal is not specifically about STEM, a lot of these industries are relating to STEM. Um, so some of these examples include um, £8 million worth of investment in the Tayside Aviation Academy, um, thousands of high value jobs in the Tay Biomedical Cluster, um, the University of Dundee and the James Hutton Institute are working on groundbreaking um, indoor vertical farming work, so relating to agriculture, food production and development. Um, there's a huge amount of work going on within the area looking at cyber resilience and digital forensics. Um, computer games design has, has really um, been a stalwart in, in, in Dundee in terms of the, the job market and being at the forefront of that industry. Um, and also lots of projects relating to renewable energy and oil and gas decommissioning. So when we think about this, that's that's what the context looks like for the learners and young people that you're working with. These these are where these jobs are going to appear. Um, if we take it even closer to home, um, so we're not projecting forward, um, but even if we think about the current context in terms of COVID-19, um, what we have here, and again, I'll share the link to this um, in the chat for you. If you've not seen these before, um, the Skills Development Scotland Regional Skills Assessments are really, really helpful, particularly if you are if you're doing your um, probationary year just now and you're maybe um, you might end up moving on to a different local authority when you take up your next post, or maybe if you're working in an area that you've not lived in before, so you might not be as familiar with the local area. Um, these reports give you a wee bit of background on the area that, that you're working in and the experiences of your young people. Um, so this is the, the most recent um, regional skills assessment from March 2021. So this has given us information and data from during the COVID pandemic. Um, so despite the employment challenges posed by COVID, where lots of industries and businesses had to, had to shut down, staff were put on furlough, there were still over 4,000 STEM related jobs advertised during the height of the pandemic. Um, and you can see that I've picked these out with the um, sort of we read overly on the um, bar chart. And um, the highlighted jobs show the importance of nursing and healthcare jobs, which is a massive sector within Tayside. 
um, but also picks out the increased reliance on digital skills relating to programming and software development and in particular IT user support which um, is straddling all areas of business particularly when lots of businesses and industries are now making that move to have more and more of their staff working from home there's an increased requirement for that remote IT support and um, what we also can see is when we're talking about when we're talking about STEM jobs there's often a preconception um, that STEM is for learners who are very good at science, who are very academic, um, who will gain hires in schools and then follow a pathway that takes them on to university level study. When you look at this graph though, you can see that in Tayside, um, although we do have um, medical practitioners as one of the examples, and that might be um, a traditional um, doctor, so somebody going from school on to study medicine at university needing very high levels of academic qualifications. There's also a significant number of technician roles related to science and engineering. So it's really important that we're not just thinking about STEM for our highest attainers in school, but we're thinking about developing these STEM skills and um, problem solving aspects of interdisciplinary working for all of our learners so that they can contribute to the development of the economy. So moving on from this, we need to think about how, how, how do we do this and um, what's, what's happening in Scotland that's going to help us achieve these aims. Um, what we have up on the screen just now is um, the, the 14 key actions from the Scottish Government's STEM strategy. Now, we're not going to go through all 14 because there's, there's a lot in there. There's lots of different people responsible for different parts of this plan but you'll be able to see some of the key aspects that are highlighted in bold. Delivering enhanced STEM professional learning, improving STEM learning and teaching, tackling inequity in STEM learning and careers, recognising and celebrating success and improving the support available to schools. All of these aspects, although they may not be the responsibility of teachers and education practitioners, they are all there where you will have opportunities to be involved in these. So it might not be you necessarily that's delivering the professional learning, but as part of the STEM strategy, there's an increased offer um, to build confidence of all practitioners in, in these sectors. Um, another example, recognising and celebrating success. There's a number of programmes that have been introduced, um, the Young STEM Leaders Programme and the STEM Nation Awards. These programmes have been introduced to help with that inspiration and to support people making that journey towards a really high quality STEM education. Um, I will just pop into the chat just now um, a link to the STEM strategy. So if this is the first time um, if this is the first time that you're coming across this, um, you can follow this up in your own time. Um, bear with me just a wee oh, second. It, it, Abby, it, it, I think you you've maybe got your mic on by accident. Thanks, Abby. Um, and what we also have um, on this slide here, we've got the first, second and third annual report, which has just been released with some up to date information. Fundamentally, though, one of the key things that, that you can do as an education practitioner is thinking about how we can raise the STEM capital of all learners. Um, what I would like to do is just take a wee pause there before I go any further. Um, hopefully you should all be able to find the raise hand button. Um, could you please raise your hand if STEM or science capital is a term that you've heard of before? So is that a brand new, brand new concept for everybody? Oh no, I've got a couple. I've got two people, I think. And I wonder if you have heard of it, Karen. I wonder if you would mind um, sort of putting into the chat where is it that you've heard about that concept? Is it from something that you've read or a colleague?
There's nothing like the pressure of those three wee dots when somebody's typing. <laughs> Just give me a wee second, Karen. Maybe come back up and um, pick up on Karen's response in a wee second, but but just while I've got this up on the screen just now, on the left-hand side, we have the Scottish Government's definition from the strategy. So STEM capital is the concept that a wide range of knowledge, experiences, attitudes, behaviours and practices will influence people in a range of ways. It helps shed light on why particular social groups remain underrepresented and why many young people do not see science careers as being for me. On the right hand side, what we also have is we have a little um, picture from the Spires research. Um, now, the Spires research focuses on science capital, but we do use the terms interchangeably. And um, so we might talk about STEM or science capital, depending on where the research is coming from. And it sums up really nicely with what you know, how you think, what you do and who you know. Um, and I'm just picking up Karen, that's great. So you've read a wee bit about it before. Um, for anybody that's not come across the term previously, I'm just going to stick in the um, chat box a link to a wee two minute video. Um, and we'll not look, look at this today, but I would highly encourage you to have a wee look that just tells you a wee bit more about the background of STEM capital and about the research that's been carried out um, by the King's College London um, and University College London team led by Professor Louise Archer, which looks into a lot of what Mary was saying in terms of um, stereotypes and unconscious bias, but thinking specifically about how some of these ideas develop in relation to STEM. In terms of what you can do in your practice, I'm just going to go through a quick little slide with you to give you an overview of some of the um, approaches that can be used. Um, so when we think about science capital, there are eight key dimensions that you can think about as a practitioner to, to sort of include in your practice. Um, the first one being scientific literacy. Um, so that's about supporting students' understanding of science and how science works. That, that can be at advanced higher level when you're thinking about somebody studying advanced higher physics, but you can also apply exactly the same logic to working with a three-year-old in an early year setting where they want to know how something works. They want to work with uh, a toy or an object and sort of deconstruct, put it back together again. We can really think about that scientific literacy across a whole number of contexts. And the second one is science-related attitudes, values and dispositions. Um, so this is discussing the value of scientific developments and the role science plays in culture, society and the local community. We are hugely fortunate in Scotland that we've got a really rich history of, of STEM and science and technology developments. Um, so we want to be having those conversations with our young people. It's also important to talk about the use and misuse of scientific and everyday life. Um, whether that's marketing claims or climate change, there's lots of material just now when we're talking about vaccinations and um, some people who are in support of vaccinations, some people who are not, whether the science behind some of those concerns is, is, is really reliable. Um, also broadening the idea that a di diverse range of people use science skills and applications. So we're thinking about inquiry, creativity, um, analysis. We are not just talking about um, scientists, doctors, engineers, but we're talking about those inquiry, creativity and problem solving skills that could be used in every aspect of life. I'm um, also thinking about the transferability of science. Um, so when we're talking to young people, highlighting science skills involved in the very jobs that students may aspire. Um, so that might be a case of framing analytical skills. Um, if a young person was aspiring to go on and do law or journalism, those analysis skills that you might develop, in, uh, develop from a science experiment can actually be really useful when it comes to um, journalism or, or law, um, as well as when you're thinking about everyday life. So there's a huge, huge impact on financial decisions and, and personal money management. Um, science media consumption. 
encouraging students to watch science documentaries on TV. Um, the Blue Planet is a brilliant idea. Um, you can actually build that into the work that you're doing. Um, but also having conversations about science related news. Again, with the COVID-19 pandemic, there's even more science in the news that we might have had previously. But it's, it's a case of with your learners, you don't need to know the answers to all of these questions, but it's encouraging young people to engage in the, the dialogue. Um, participation in out of school science learning is something that you as a practitioner can encourage. Um, so pointing students to local science learning opportunities in the case of Tayside, this might be um, offers from the um, Dundee Science Centre, um, it might be um, possibly maintaining a, a what's on calendar in your school about different uh, science festivals um, or even just activities that can be completed at home. Um, so, so um, citizen science projects about um, bird watches, different projects like that that learners can take in their own context. Um, that also links us in with the next one, which is thinking about family science skills, knowledge and qualifications. Um, again, it's trying to encourage learners to think about the skills that the people that they know have and how we as education practitioners can demonstrate those links to STEM. Um, the next one, knowing people in science related roles. When we think about learners that, that maybe do come from a background where there are low levels of STEM capital, we can have a huge influence on them as education practitioners by linking in with different organisations, whether that's STEM partners through your school or whether it's getting a STEM ambassador to come out to speak to young people about their job. There's loads that we can do there. Um, and then the last one, um, talking about science in everyday life. Um, so you might actually be doing a project in class, but rather than having um, a homework task being a worksheet, you could ask, actually have your homework task being a survey where a learner's got to go and speak to different people in their family about their experiences, what they know about science. And the real benefit here is trying to normalise that conversation about science, not just with the learner, but with the learner and the family as well, so that we're building the full community um, STEM capital rather than just individual people. Um, moving on very quickly, um, I'll share some of these links um, just at the end, but there are a number of different resources here um, that you can pick up and you can work with. The Science Capital Teaching Approach is a fantastic resource for um, secondary teachers. Um, there is a new primary version that's due to be released this year. Um, also, we have the Yes STEM project. Um, now, it's looking at youth equity in STEM and social justice. So there's lots of aspects here where, at the moment, access and engagement to STEM is not equal between different social groups. And that's a real aspiration of the project to address. And one of the things, um, the two diagrams on the right show in a wee bit more detail some of the core equitable practices and also the Yes STEM Compass, which can be used as a self-evaluation tool to think about your learning and to think about how you're developing those equitable approaches to STEM in your own context. Um, last but not least, before I hand back over to Mary, um, what I wanted to share with you on this slide um, was just some of the education resources, Education Scotland resources that are available to support your work. Um, so the two links up the top um, go to our stemnation.scot website and our um, STEM resources on the National Improvement Hub. One of the key resources that I would encourage you to have a wee look at if you're, if you're just sort of starting out with STEM is the self-evaluation and improvement framework. It helps you see whether you're just at the start of your journey or whether it's something that you're going to take further. Um, we've also got a number of case studies and exemplars and some more information from STEM professional learning surveys that have been carried out. Um, also, the last bit down the bottom, you can keep up to date by following our STEM Ed Scott Twitter account, um, where you'll also be able to access our fortnightly um, STEM planner, which gives you um, links to different uh, competitions or different lesson resources and ideas that you can pick up and use. Um, and what I'm just going to do just now, Mary, I'll hand back over to you. Um, and just while I hand back over, I'll put those last couple of links in the chat, but I'll move on to the next slide for you just now, Mary. That's great. Thanks, Hazel. Thank you for that. Um, so I thought we'd have a wee look at the impact of COVID. 
COVID has gendered implications for children and young people. School closures, social distancing and containment strategies will impact girls and boys differently, especially adolescent girls who, due to gender roles, might be expected to take on care duties and that's going to limit their access to remote learning programmes. Remote learning might have resulted in a narrowed curriculum for some young people and gender stereotypes may unintentionally have influenced the types of activities individuals are directed towards. We know that under normal circumstances, boys are more likely than girls to spend time on computers and on the internet, and that girls and boys use computers differently in their leisure time. And it's possible that this will affect how readily some children and young people are accessing and navigating online learning. Gender imbalances and self-efficacy which is like self-belief and confidence are likely to have resulted in complex gendering around accessing and progressing with remote learning. Barriers related to gender will likely intersect with others. For example, families living in poverty might not have a device or a broadband connection. Learners with additional support needs might have disproportionate difficulty in accessing online learning materials. Next slide, please. Thank you. So where does IGBE fit in within the context of the whole school? A lot of what we do in addressing gender imbalances links directly with confidence and empowering young people to see that they have the potential to succeed in a wide variety of areas. Because of that, addressing gender stereotyping could be seen to have a positive impact in a wide variety of the national priorities. By embedding a focus on skill development to help young people see that it's a combination of a variety of skills that make up the components of jobs, the focus would be taken off jobs being for men and women. This links with um, developing the young workforce. Research has shown that there are gender gaps in attainment, so with a focus on reducing gender stereotyping, schools could look at strategies to raise attainment as well as potentially improving engagement with literacy, numeracy and STEM. And with regards to health and wellbeing, we're promoting breaking down the stereotypes, which will hopefully help young people in a variety of ways, but to name one specifically, hopefully help boys in recognising that it's healthy to talk to people about problems and help to reduce that heartbreaking statistic about male suicide rates. And at the core of it all, learning and teaching. By embedding IGBE strategies within learning and teaching, it will hopefully help young people to engage further in lessons to the benefit of their own education. And those are just a few examples of how IGBE fits into all aspects of school life and why it's so important to consider when working in schools. We're now going to consider what's happening with the learning and teaching in our classes around interactions and feedback. Our unconscious bias can have a massive impact on how we interact with people in very subtle ways. This was an observation activity and the results found that girls and boys were getting criticised for different things and praised for different things. In terms of feedback, boys were criticised for behaviour but praised for work content, ideas, the processes they went through to solve the problem and understanding. So teachers were more likely to compliment boys' work to make up for reprimanding behaviour. Girls were criticised for work content and praised for good behaviour and effort. Girls' behaviour receives less negative feedback, so criticism is focused on ability. This impacts girls' confidence and send, sends boys a message that they can succeed even if their behaviour isn't great. And examples of this that you might see in a class, getting a group of boys to settle, praising them for sitting and writing the date and trying the first question. A group of quiet girls have answered a few questions and the feedback might be, great, this one's not quite right, here's what you could do to improve it. And similarly, giving back a test, maybe saying to the boys, did you not revise enough? And to the girls, was there something you didn't understand? So subtle but distinctively different types of feedback. If you're vaguely familiar with the work of Carol Dweck around fixed and growth mindset, you'll have noticed that what the boys are getting praised for is task and process related. Looking at the processes we go through and skills we use to solve a problem or achieve a task helps to promote a growth mindset.
Getting praised for effort and behaviour doesn't help to develop that growth mindset. We need for when we get to a problem that we don't immediately know how to solve. Effort is required to achieve these outcomes and we should still feel that we can praise hard work and effort, but it's worth also ensuring we're commenting and praising the specific problem solving processes or learning techniques that these young people have gone through, as that's where the understanding comes from and that's what a young person needs to employ when they get to the next problem. In terms of interactions, this data comes from the Improving Gender Balance Pilot Project. So on the charts, green represents boys and blue girls. The proportions of the answers from in the checkups should be roughly similar to the numbers and that will vary class to class. But as you can see, the majority of voices heard are boys and the majority of teacher time or attention focuses on boys. And it might be interesting to see the influence of gender with a blended learning model. Who speaks more during online teaching? How do children of different genders respond to feedback? Each of these examples reflect a huge societal issue and stereotypes that impact confidence, choice and engagement, but we can make small changes to make learning environments more inclusive. For example, we've got an interactions monitoring template, which you could ask a colleague or someone in your class to monitor where your time goes, because you might not be aware of that, and that can act as a useful baseline to target interventions um, regarding interactions. So what are some of the changes we can make? An important part of the process is around reflection and practice. These are a few examples of things you may wish to consider as a starting point when interacting with children and young people. So language. Some teachers have admitted using different language in reports about girls and boys. Even using the term girls, boys or guys, could you use alternatives to that? Pronouns, assuming male is default, so when discussing jobs with the engineer, he did this. Pet names, sweetie, love, buddy, pal, champ, they're generally used more for girls and boys, but I think being aware of these and whether or not they reinforce stereotypes is really important. Seating plans, are you using boy, girl? And examine the motivations behind this. Does it play up to imagined or socially confirming stereotypes? Does it reinforce them? Certainly, I know that I would sometimes use seating plans as behaviour tools, often spreading out the boys as far as possible and interspersing them with girls, reinforcing the expectation that their behaviour can only be good if it's tamed by sitting next to a girl. In terms of earnings and expectations about job roles, getting boys to carry things, trust with the girls to go to the office, and you might not be as explicit as this, but try and reflect on who you choose to do these things and whether it reinforces stereotypes. Within um, tasks, do boys naturally do the practical, physical side and girls do the tidying and the writing up? If that's the case, by assigning roles within these sessions, that can help to avoid this. In behaviour, accepting of worse behaviour from boys, like the boys will be boys attitude, or due to expecting worse behaviour from boys, to be look out for it more, then discipline boys more readily and possibly more harshly. Evidence shows that on average boys account for 79% of all exclusions. Do you expect girls will be the quiet compliant ones and then you're more shocked when they aren't? And in terms of interactions, boys talk out more and girls tend to be quieter. Research shows that on the whole, boys tend to dominate classroom spaces. So reflect on this and see, is this the case? And how can it be avoided? Things maybe like no hands up, lolly sticks, think, pair, share, ideas like that. So let's hope this works. Um, delving into some of the areas I've spoken about already, are there unconscious expectations about who does what during a practical session? Can you think of interactions that you have with young people? Do particular groups of individuals take up more of your time? And is this because of gendered expectations? Do you come with expectations about behaviour of the young people? What pronouns do you assume? In images you use or things you talk about, do you consider representation? And it does matter because it's difficult to be what you can't see. And this of course will apply to other non-traditional, sorry, other protected characteristics such as race, disability, sexuality, things like that. Like having displays that have a diverse range of people doing diverse things is one way to make your environment more inclusive. 
I'd like you to go into the Jamboard and the link's just been posted there and think about any examples of things maybe you're now aware of having done either yourself or things that you've maybe seen in your setting and also any actions that you can think of to try and address these things and remember on, on Jamboard anything that you put is anonymous so I'm going to try and share the Jamboard so as we can see what comes up but as we know it didn't go well the last time so I'll just try and share And this is just going to be that screen again. So I will drag this across. Do you see that, Hazel? Yep, Mary, I can see that in the window now. So if you just click on the wee post-its at the side, the wee sticky notes, and if you write a comment and then you can... Great, there's one up already. And it's on my small screen, so I can't read it very well. So boys will often offer to take a practical job. Thank you. <laughs> take a practical job from girls in the class. Ah, right, that's to the boys themselves, actually. Do that when you've specifically asked a girl to do that. That's interesting, isn't it? I'll just give a wee minute and see if anything else comes back up. Um, and it might be something that you've not necessarily done yourself. It might be something um, that you've seen within your setting that you now recognise as being like gendered. Oh yeah, I was a PE teacher before and if there was anything about moving benches, it was always the boys that wanted to do it. No, <laughs> girls can go to the toilet in a group, but boys go individually. And nursery boys outside or more. Ah, okay, yeah. I'll just give a, a couple more minutes. Um, and if you think as well of any actions. What I'll do, the, the Jamboard will be, will continue to be available for you. Is that a perception? Girls can be trusted to carry out tasks more than boys. Oh, there's lots coming up and they're all on top of each other. Um, let me see. Yeah, boys' voices often dominate in the class. More likely to make jokes, yeah. Um, girls can be trusted to carry out tasks more than boys. I'm wondering, is that is that something that you believe or something that is a kind of stereotype? Or have a jobs list and choose names. That's Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, girls often offer to clean. That's some really good ideas and really it's it's really good to see these things coming up. But as what I'll do is I'll come back on here, but the jam board will stay open so you'll be able to still see things on there. Um Oh, I would need to stop sharing though. So I'll stop sharing. And I'll move on to the next slide, but please keep adding stuff on. You can all see that as things go on, I hope. So, and this is a summary of some of the things that you might want to try as initial steps or for new ideas. And to reflect the kind of multi-pronged approach required, it's been broken down into something for your own professional learning and something you can try with young people to enable them to lead the way or inform any interventions. So things we've spoken about, catch yourself, like don't ask for volunteers, maybe assign things yourself. Um, 
not using male pronoun, pronouns automatically, monitoring where are you spending most of your time with your interactions. Um, the thing there that links with what Hazel was saying, focus on transferable skills rather than what do you enjoy or um, or link things to experiences to discuss a range of careers and role models. So within things like subject choice, trying if you're focusing some some girls, for example, if they lack confidence in physics, if you're saying to them, so what are you good at in terms of choosing their subject? they'll maybe think, well, no, I'm not good at physics, so I'm not going to choose that. So if you can break that down into the skills, then you can be saying, well, you know, you, you like these skills, you're good at these things here, and that might make them consider it more rather than writing physics off. And you can also undertake further professional learning. We're um, offering the IGBE team and the STEM team offer um, professional learning like quite a lot of the time, so just keep an eye out for that. In terms of the things you can do with young people you can do the word cloud activity on menti or just as i said on paper you can get the young people to do an environmental audit have a look at any resources that you're using any posters in the room are there gendered messages there using books as a focus for discussions so if there's a book where the lead character's a male would it change the story if the lead character was a female um Careers quick sort activities, so have different careers and ask the young people what ones are for boys, what ones are for girls, what ones are for both, just to, and then have a discussion around that. Draw a scientist, do they automatically draw a male, so then you get, get them to name the scientist and then explore, so, so why is that? Could this scientist be a, a female and um, maybe draw in some female role models? And ask their thoughts, especially with the UNCRC, ask their thoughts on fair treatment, equality and diversity. And the last thing here that talks about action guides and case studies, um, like we've got like a lot of, similar to STEM, we've got a lot of resources in our National Improvement Hub page. Um, there's an introduction guide, a primary guide, a secondary guide, and a, there's a lot of um, resources you can use within your class as well. So there's some, some for your professional learning yourself and some that you can actually be taking and using with um, different ages of um, young people. I think the important thing to remember is to try something and see how it goes. From experience, people worry about saying the wrong thing, but actually if that happens, you can harness this and use saying the wrong thing as a discussion point with learners. Um, and remember, making these changes should hopefully enable your learners the opportunity to engage in whatever feeling, behaviour, activity or pathway they choose without feeling limited by gender stereotypes. And that's the important thing, that everyone's able to follow their own path, do what they want, everything's open. They're not going to self-select out of activities because they feel they should be going down a particular route. And the next slide, please. Are there any questions? Do you want to go on to the next one, please? So we've got an evaluation forum that he, Hazel will put in the link, and it would be really helpful if um, you save that because that will help inform like what we do in future. So we'd really be grateful. It would take a couple of minutes to fill that in. If there's any links from the chat that you would like to save, then save them before you um, leave the, the meeting. Um, the Improving Gender Balance and Equalities team have a national network and every month we share two resources and then we've also got a drop-in session for colleagues to have an informal chat and the chance to share good practice. Um, so if you're keen to join that, we would love to have more people on that. If you go into Teams and if you click on join a team with a code and type in the code PHGV0CY, and I think that's been put in the chat as well. If you're on Twitter, please feel free to share your thoughts and don't forget to tag us at EdScottIGBE and STEM EdScott. 
And lastly, but most importantly, thank you so much for coming along and taking part today and I really hope you found it useful. If you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to get in touch and there'll be a slide with our email addresses coming up and you can see in the chat pane, I've put my own email address there. Hazel, as some of you heard at the start, is going off on maternity leave on Friday, so we'll not put hers on there, but the STEM um, email address is there. Um, so you can, if there's any follow-up questions, please do get in touch with us. And I don't think any questions have arrived. But um, yeah, we're really happy to take this forward. We feel this is really important and if you know, please get in touch if you want any resources or anything like that.